Software Engineering Radio Episode 36, Interview with Guy Steele. Welcome. This is another episode of Software Engineering Radio. Today we have an interview episode with Guy Steele. Guy works as a researcher for Sun Microsystems Labs and he's mainly involved in programming language research. You probably know his name. He has been working quite a bit on uh, Lisp. He is the author of uh, the Common Lisp Language Reference Manual. He's also worked on Fortran, so he's really an authority in the programming language design area. And in this interview, we talk about his new project, the Fortress language. We have recorded this interview at the Chao conference in October 2006 in Denmark. Um, that's also why you can hear some background noise from the exhibition area of the conference. But it's still quite good quality. Um, have fun with the interview, and we're really pleased to have Guy on the podcast. Maybe we start by uh, introducing, by you introducing yourself a little bit and telling us what you're doing, where you're working and um, what your background is in programming language design, obviously. All right. Uh, right now I'm working at Sun Microsystems at the research laboratory, uh, the division on the east coast of the United States in Burlington, Massachusetts. I run a group called the Programming Language Research Group of that laboratory. And right now we're working on a new programming language called Fortress, which is uh, intended to be a programming language for high-end scientific computing. Okay, and this is also going to, the, going to be the topic of the talk, of this discussion. But maybe briefly, let's, let's take a look into your history. You've been working quite a bit with Lisp, I guess, and Scheme, right? I have. I learned Lisp in 1970. That's been 36 years now. <laughs> <laughs> and Before uh, my time, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I first became fascinated with programming languages when I was uh, age 14. And there was a... Um, computer at the school I was attending, Boston Latin School, and an alumnus uh, who was an executive at IBM had made sure the school had an IBM 1130, which was a 16-bit mini-computer, and it ran Fortran, had mm -hmm. a Fortran compiler, so I learned to program in Fortran. Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, I learned some other programming languages, including APL, which became an IBM product in 1969, the next year. It was announced at the uh, Spring Joint Computer Conference, which happened to be held in Boston, and I... Uh, Even though I was 15 years old, I attended the ex exhibits area of the conference and was fascinated by the IBM booth, a by this new geek. programming language. Yeah, I was, I was a geek. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Uh, I remember one time from that period when I was walking around with a friend in downtown Boston and some teenage girls passed us in the other direction. And I knew they were looking at me because as they passed, one of them said, Wow, did you see all the pens in his pocket? <laughs> Those were the days of pocket protectors and pens in the pocket, yeah, and I yeah. was a geek. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so one last question on this Lisp thing. Um, today, some of the concepts in Lisp are kind of revived in other languages like Ruby, like the metaprogramming stuff or something. Do you think there is some kind of resurgence of some of this dynamically typed and, and metaprogramming-oriented programming language thing? Yeah, I think there is, is a research, but I think there are just some basic ideas that they got right in Lisp mm -hmm. that, that people are constantly rediscovering are useful, good ideas. Yep. The idea of automatic storage management with a garbage collector was a good idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea of rep having a way to represent programs as data in a better way than a string mm -hmm. was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's that second idea that makes metaprogramming so much easier. In, mm -hmm. in Lisp and such languages. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's switch over to your current project, the Fortress language. Um, can you outline what the goals of this language are? Why do we need a new language is probably the, the classical question. Well, we would like to do for the Fortran community what Java did for the C community. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, in fact, the people in the scientific community came to me shortly after Java came out and said, Java has some wonderful features but it's not quite adequate for our purposes. Could you mm. please extend Java so it's more like Fortran, and then we can have the benefits of internet programming and uh, downloading code to web browsers and such like that. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, there were some proposals put through the Java community process to make Java more suitable for the scientific programmers, and they were not passed. Mm -hmm. And I, th I was disappointed at the time, but now I think I realize that the needs of scientific programmers are very different from the needs of commercial and internet programmers. Mm -hmm. 
and making the language better for one community might make it worse for another. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Java community process, I think, reacted correctly uh, mm-hmm. for its community mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, said, no, we like Java the way it is with respect to those changes. Yep. But there was still this need in the scientific community yep. for a safer code, uh, easier to program code, libraries that can talk to the internet. Mm-hmm. And when the opportunity came along to do a, um, a new computer system design for, as part of a DARPA contract, we decided to tackle the programming language question as a part of that, mm-hmm. that contract. Mm-hmm. As we started doing research, and we said, what can we do for the Fortran community yep. to make their lives easier? And we started, to, instead of just starting with Fortran and making it more Java-like, mm-hmm. <laughs> or starting with Java and make it more Fortran-like, yeah. we decided to start from scratch yep. and, and do a requirements analysis. And Fortress came out of that. And, and to give us a, a first overview, what are some of the, you know, in one ten sentence or two, what are the, some of the most important features that are actually necessary for the scientific community that distinguishes it from Java, say? First of all, they need an appropriate set of data types and operations for them. They work a lot with floating-point numbers. Java actually has a very limited set of floating-point operations. Yep. Uh, they need higher-level mathematical abstractions, particularly vectors and matrices. Mm-hmm. Uh, they need uh, ways of dealing with data structures that operate at multiple levels of resolution. Mm-hmm. When you're doing physical simulations, uh, there are places in the physical simulation where there is a lot of physical activity, yep. and you need a very fine grid for doing those simulations. Mm-hmm. In other parts, not much is going on. The wind isn't blowing, the, the sun isn't shining, yeah. and you don't need to assign so many processors there. You don't need yeah. to allocate so much data there. Yeah. And so there are these very elaborate things that they've programmed with great difficulty in Fortran, so-called multi-grid structures. Mm-hmm. And better support for that kind of thing would be useful. Yeah, yeah. And finally, uh, we wanted to provide a better notation for them. They mm-hmm. are used to working with a mathematical notation. We thought that if we could bring the programming language closer to what they write on the whiteboard or in their papers. So for example, might make it easier to write papers. Instead of, re- uh, instead, of, yeah, instead of using an asterisk for multiplication, just write nothing? Yes, for example. Or yes. blank? Yes, they're not used to writing asterisks. In fact, asterisk usually means something else to them, like yes. Hermitian conjugative matrix. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and little notational things can make a big yeah. difference to yeah. a programmer. If you can make it, in some ways, we're trying to make a domain specific language for scientists. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So I, I read in, in one of the presentations I saw about this topic um, that you don't try to build the language or design it by committee, <laughs> but rather try to grow it. Well, what does that mean, growing a language? Uh, it means that. Programming languages are very complicated, and you you can't build it all at once. Uh, it's going to take time. You know, Java has grown over time, yep. uh, and I don't think that James Gosling envisioned what Java would look like in the year 2006, back when he was doing it in 1994. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so uh, every programming language has grown over time. Mm-hmm. We asked ourselves the question: If we know that the programming language is going to grow, and we want to support that growth what technical changes would we make to the language to make that growth easier? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so if we plan for growth, we thought that might change the way we design the language. So that... And it has to some extent. And we'll talk about that later, and that could, for example, be that you have many features in libraries instead of hard-coded as in the language definition. Yes. So do you think there's a risk to this approach because um, you might compromise, you know, the the, the, the co- coherence or the, the, the uniformity of the language concepts, or didn't that turn out to be a problem yet? Or, oh, On the contrary, I think it is a big risk. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, we, we risk losing uh, the, co- the coherency of the design. Yep. Uh, I think one of the reasons that Java turned out to, to be a coherent design is that one guy was in charge of it, James yeah. Gosling. Yep. And a lot of the really good programming languages at the beginning were... Yep. Maybe not the inventions of one guy, but one guy made the decisions yeah. as, as that this fits and this doesn't fit yes. the vision of the language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas with programming languages designed by committee, you got uh, a larger set of useful features, but the features th- didn't always fit together in the right ways. Yeah, yeah. So let's, I, I guess that, of course, I, I know because I read the, <laughs> the slides, but uh, so I guess that uh, one important feature for this language is uh, kind of primitive or built-in support for parallelism. parallelism. Concurrency yes. is an obvious important thing. So can you talk about maybe uh, about atomicity versus default parallelism and also maybe talk about some of the influences? I could ex- imagine that Occam, for example, had some influences on, on the design of Fortress at this point. Or 
Yes, quite a bit. As we designed our parallel st- constructs, I actually considered borrowing the Seek and Par constructs from Occam. Mm-hmm. And then we thought, no, that actually puts sequentialism and parallelism on an equal frame. Yeah, yeah. And we really want to bias it toward parallelism. Okay. Yeah. And so we came up with a, a do loop syntax that is by default parallel. And mm-hmm. you have to, we purposely make you pay a syntactic tax mm-hmm. to get a sequential program. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's an experiment. We'll see whether programmers like it. Mm-hmm. What kinds of other low level or first level support things are there for parallelism? At the lowest level, you can actually create a new thread, just the okay. same way you say new thread in Java. Yeah. And uh, that is a very general mechanism. It's sometimes hard for a compiler to optimize, mm-hmm. but it is completely general. And we view that as a tool for library writers to use to make parallel abstractions. There's another, another low-level um, construct in language, which is simply that if you put two expressions between parentheses and put a comma between, they get evaluated mm-hmm. in parallel. Mm-hmm. So this means that arguments to a function can be evaluated in parallel, mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. example. So it's funny because the comma is usually the sequencing operator in for... In C, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the parallelism <laughs> operator in, in, in Fortress. Yes, again, that's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a funny joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, however, semicolon is still sequencing in okay. Fortress. So <laughs> you can always use the semicolon. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, w- I mentioned this before. Um, y- you said that you tr- like to have as many features as possible as part of libraries instead of the language core. Um, and also you talked about syntax extension or being able to add like mathematically looking syntax to the language. How do you handle uh, syntax extension through libraries? Or maybe rephrasing the question, how far can you extend the syntax? You, you probably know about the IP project or intentional software where they can project a program to anything. So how far do you, do you go with this, with this syntax sugaring or whatever you'd call this? Well, it turns out that a lot of mathematical syntax um, actually falls into one of five or six standard patterns. You've got things that are subscripted or superscripted. Mm-hmm. You've got infix and prefix and postfix operators. You have things like big sigma that add up a bunch of, of values. You evaluate an expression many times. And those capture about 90% of the notation. Mm-hmm. And so by providing those as standard patterns mm-hmm. and allowing the library to define the semantics of an operator, that part of the syntax is actually kind of built in. Mm-hmm. But then there's a separate syntactic extension mechanism for the patterns that don't fit those cases. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess also that one of the reasons that you... Uh, tackle this mathematical notation problem these days is that you have Unicode, so you have more than 256 characters you can use in your program, like the 29 <laughs> kinds of parentheses you <laughs> talked about, I think. Yes, that's right. Unicode has 20, 29 kinds of parentheses, <laughs> and there, there will probably be more coming. I don't think you want to use all 29 in one <laughs> yes, program, but, yes. but having perhaps six or eight kinds instead of the three you have in ASCII uh, yeah. can, can make a program more expressive. Yeah. So uh, how does this library-based language extension thing um, influence the potential for optimization? Uh, how much compiler optimization can there be if stuff is contributed through libraries? Is this, I mean, it's certainly a concern in this kind of language. So, Well, first of all, the, compi- the com- poor compiler will need to know a lot about optimizing method calls and function calls. Mm-hmm. And we are assuming... Uh, the kinds of optimizations you see in hotspot compilers now for being able to do uh, both static and dynamic prediction of which method is the most likely one in an overloaded dispatch, that kind of thing. But the other thing is we expect to do some of the traditional compiler optimizations at the library level. A lot of the knowledge that's built into a compiler's code generator can be expressed if you have a rich enough type system. Mm -hmm. And by doing polymorphic method dispatch, in effect, you can do code selection mm-hmm. and express code selectors at the library level. Mm-hmm. So it's not a, something that, that kind of conflicts. It's the optimization thing doesn't conflict the library-based approach. Yes. Um, so uh, we didn't mention that before, but um, I take it that, that Fortress code will also run on some kind of VM, maybe even on the Java VM, or, or is it natively compiled? Right now, we have implemented a toy interpreter. This mm-hmm. is sort of a standard first step in yeah, trying course. out an experimental yes. language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will then work on a compiler. Okay, natively uh, then, yes. I guess. Okay. So the initial interpreter is written in Java. Mm-hmm. So it will it, anywhere you can run a Java virtual machine, you can run this interpreter. Nice. The next step will be to target a compiler at, at JVM bytecodes. Yep. And then the third step will be to build a customized VM for yep. Fortress. Yeah. Okay. And um, you talked about, again, mentioned this a couple of times now, about the ability to extend the language through libraries, but I still guess you'll, you'll have a big set of standard libraries so that, you, that, the, that there is yeah, a, signific- a, a big enough set of stuff that people can rely on that's existing. 
That's right. It's our intention to, to, to make Fortress be open source. And that's one reason we want to emphasize the library approach, because that makes it easier for third parties to participate. Yeah. But a big mistake is to say, oh, it's open source, therefore other people will do the job and we don't have to. <laughs> yeah. No, we will provide a full standard library, yeah. and we will organize it into modules. It's important that the standard library not be monolithic. Yeah. We, want, we will divide it up into components. In fact, there is a there are features for component management in the Fortress language. Which so we're going to talk about, yes. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, the the type system is quite interesting, I thought, because it's it is a statically typed language. Yes, right? it's a strongly statically typed language. The type system is fairly complicated because we want to be able to describe complicated relationships mm -hmm. among data structures at mm -hmm. compile time. Mm -hmm. But you still use type inference, so you don't have to sp write down the type everywhere, just like C sharp three zero, I think, does it. That's right. Wh one thing we noticed when watching scientists write on whiteboards, you know, they're sketching out their algorithms, they don't right. write down the types. They've, yes. got the, they've got the types in their heads, yeah. for the most part. Yeah. And they tend to write things like x equals y squared. And sometimes they mean that, that they're testing whether x equals y squared, but more often they just mean let x equal y squared. Mm. And they don't bother to write the type of x because it's the same as the type of y squared. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's a simple example of type inference yeah. uh, when you have a simple equality like that. But there are a lot of other situations where Uh, the types can be correctly implicitly inferred. There's only one type. And mm -hmm. why make the programmer write it down everywhere when it only clutters his thinking? Yeah, yeah. If he wants to write it explicitly, he can. Yeah, yeah. That makes, makes a lot of sense, yeah. So let's talk a bit more about some of the type system details. Um, while preparing this, this discussion, I, I obviously looked at some material of, of the Fortress language, and there are a couple of things I found interesting. You talked about traits, uh, using traits instead of classical multiple inheritance, I guess. Yes. Or instead of using implementation inheritance. And uh, you also um, mentioned that there is some support for automated or integrated unit testing as part uh, of the type yes. system. I found yes. that very interesting. So please elaborate on these kinds of a little bit. All right. Well, uh, a trait in the Fortress language, the idea of trait was borrowed for some work that was done in the Smalltalk community. Mm -hmm. And uh, a trait you can think of as a Java interface, except it can have code in it. It's like a mix-in? It's sort of like a mix-in, yes. Okay. So, so uh, a trait can inherit from several other traits, mm -hmm. and objects can inherit from traits. Mm -hmm. And you can inherit not only code, but also testing information and uh, contract information. So one can put contracts on methods that, that describe how they are intended to behave. Contracts in the sense of uh, the Eiffel Mile? Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. yeah, the, yeah Eiffel. Mile, the, the Eiffel language. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, programming by contract. Yes, okay. Yeah. In addition, you can also specify invariants on, on traits and on data structures. Mm -hmm. So you can say, for example, uh, for this kind of number, uh, addition is commutative and associative, mm -hmm. and multiplication is associative but not commutative, yeah. as, as with ma matrices. And... You can also specify test data, mm -hmm. uh, that is, example data on which these properties are to be checked. Mm -hmm. And then the testing system takes it from there and automatically generates testing code that will make sure that the properties are satisfied by the test data and, and, and report errors. And the, the test system is obviously not part of the language, but it's a separate thing, I guess. But the fact that you can embed the test data in the language is, of course, a language feature. Yes. Okay. So do you think... Um, And we're going to talk, talk about another feature that fits in this category. This is actually not just interesting for, for scientists. So um, although you optimize this language for a scientific background, I think it's, it's at least it sounds also interesting for general purpose programming. Uh, certainly a side effect you, 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 you're happy about, right? So Yes. Well, I hope that it will be. Uh, you, uh, it helps when designing a language to have a particular application user community mm. be your focus yes. because it keeps your design focused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we th do have some hope that some of the technologies we develop may prove to be useful in the Java community mm -hmm. and, and in other language communities. We're not out to replace Java, but... That would have been my yes. next question. Yes, but, but, <laughs> but we are out to explore some interesting and risky new language technologies, yeah, and yeah. the ones that turn out to work may be borrowed. Yeah. So another thing I really loved about this, 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 the stuff I read about the language is this notion of components, where you can explicitly import and export like facets or ports or interfaces or whatever you call this. Um, why, why did you? I mean, why did you put this into the language as a first-class feature? Because that's something I've never seen before in this in this way in languages. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that we wanted to think explicitly about the management of segments of the language as part of the growing language story. 
and we th think that a part of being able to grow a language is to be able to replace old parts as well as add new ones. Mm. And for that, you need component management with version control, and you able to d need to be able to, d to divide your standard library into manageable pieces. Yep. And the other is that we wanted to have programmed control over how programs are built from smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. So you can actually write executable code that will govern how components are constructed and built. So think, think in effect, think of make as being part of the language. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can also build hierarchical components. You can assemble components from, I guess, component instances of other types, of other yes, components. Yes, exactly. So because this is exactly what, for example, the embedded folks do quite a lot in the room methodology or even UML 2.0. So I, 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 and it's also stuff that I use a lot as the guiding metaphor if I do architectural stuff. So having this as part of the language, I think is, from my point of view, it's maybe even the biggest contribution of this language. So I, I really think this is really cool. Thank you. Um, another term that I found in this context is APIs. Um, how are they different from interfaces? Or what is an API? I mean, in the context of Fortress. Um, an interface describes one particular data structure. Mm -hmm. Whereas an API can describe a set of data structures, a set of function and method interfaces. Mm -hmm. Also how they collaborate, maybe? And how they collaborate, yes. Mm -hmm. And another difference is that um, uh, APIs are constrained not to have code in them, unlike the traits, which do. Mm -hmm. The one exception is that APIs can have testing code. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, let's, again, revisit this, this uh, par parallelism and concurrency stuff. Uh, there is probably some specific support for distribution and, and to being able to... to distribute different parts of an algorithm onto different nodes, machines, processors. What are the primitives that you provide there? Well, the lowest level primitives that we expect to be used by the library writers are yeah. the ability to spawn a thread and to yeah. say where that thread should be spawned. So there is a description of the machine structure. As part of the language. As part of the language. Uh -huh, cool. And uh, in previous languages, such as MPI, about the only machine description is how many processors do you have. Yeah. We've defined a fairly... Uh, elaborate data structure that can capture a lot of the properties of the machine, including how many processors, how many memories, which is not necessarily the same as the number of processors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, are the processors bundled into cores? Uh, how is storage allocated? You know, because uh, the heap that is uh, used by a storage allocator may be divided into segments, and those segments may or may not correspond to hardware memories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So all of these properties of processors and memories are described by this data structure. And by studying this data structure, a program can figure out at runtime uh, mm -hmm. how what is the best way to organize the distribution of an array onto the machine so or the distribution of threads. So you're saying instead of like knowing at the time of writing the program how the machine structure would look like and hard coding this into the into the program, you're saying that there is this kind of reflective feature about the machine and the program can optimize itself or distribute its load depending on where it's running at this time. Exactly. On the other hand, you don't want the overhead of doing that every time you distribute an array. Right. So, so there's actually a layer of indirection. From regions, one, in effect, pre-compiles something called a distribution, which is a description of that mm -hmm. mapping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you pre-compile that distribution once, and then the distribution is then, in effect, a little piece of code that knows how to map any given size array onto mm -hmm. that machine. Mm -hmm. Although this is could be considered a compile optimization at this point. Yeah, but it's fact, important, of yes. course. But, it, but that's the structure we put. In fact, that structure is something the compiler doesn't know about. That's that's a, an aspect of our current design for the standard library. Right. Yeah. And if someone figures out a better way of doing that pre-compilation, replace the library. Are you considering uh, to put in specific support for like real-time or embedded programming? Like, for example, the ability to have deadlines on uh, the execution, time budgets on the execution of, of a method or something? Because it, it sounds like it would be a related topic. It sounds like a great topic. That's something we haven't addressed yet, okay. just because that's not our chosen target audience right. initially. Okay. And that's something we'd love to get into eventually, but we have to pick our battles right yeah. now. Is there any uh, time frame until when, I mean, can people download the language and, and, and how does, how's the, 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 the roadmap? Not yet. At, at present, we have a toy interpreter working internally in the laboratory, and it's about two-thirds implemented. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are places where if you put in a certain kind of program, it will say, oh, that feature isn't implemented. Yeah. <laughs> When we get it sufficiently complete and robust enough, then we plan, first of all, to probably put it up on our website so people can type 
Fortress programs into a web page and have them evaluated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, then at a later stage, we will release the interpreter code itself, probably. We, yeah. hope, we hope to open source it, but first we need uh -huh. to work out the legal details of starting an open source community yeah. for Fortress. Yeah, well, since it's coming from Sun, I guess it's going to be open source, just like everything yes. else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> One thing I was interested in, and maybe to, to wrap up the session, um, I've seen all these slides, and they c contain an awful lot of um, Fortress code, obviously. Yes. So have you have you been writing this code before you actually had the interpreter or did you do this in parallel so i was wondering how you can come up with these huge amounts of slides with <laughs> probably correct right fortress code without having the language implemented well i'm not sure i can guarantee it's correct until okay. i ex execute it <laughs> yeah. and even the execution is no guarantee of okay. course but uh, yes we have we have been doing writing a lot of code on paper you mm -hmm. know as part of the design process yeah. you know just as an architect does sketches yes, course, and builds yeah. models yeah Uh, but we also run some of these codes through the interpreter, okay. and it, it's an iter iterative process. We yeah. write programs and we write the interpreter, and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we do the two together. And how do you uh, interact with your potential customers, uh, the scientists? Are there scientists on the team, or, or are you scientists and have this background, or how? No, I'm not a scientist. I'm a wannabe scientist. <laughs> I love science, <laughs> scientists and scientific work. Yeah. I studied physics in college. Okay, but yeah. But uh, no, we've been working with uh, representatives from uh, mostly the United States National Laboratories mm -hmm. as well as some universities. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a part of our DARPA contract, which is funding some of this work, we have a three-day review every six months mm -hmm. as well as email contact in between. Mm -hmm. And they often suggest kernel benchmarks. They, they will bring us a piece of Fortran code and say, what does this look like in Fortress? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else you want to say about Fortress? Anything I forgot to ask? Obviously, there's a lot of stuff we can't cover, but... Uh. I guess the main thing I'd like to say is that uh, while I have been the spokesperson for Fortress at this conference, it yeah. is actually a team of eight to ten persons mm -hmm. that has been working on it. Yeah. And I want to thank that team because they have provided a lot of contributions that, yeah. that yeah. Uh, I would not have been able to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we hope to open it up and get even more of the world involved in yeah. our team. Yeah. Okay, Guy, thanks you very much for being on the show. It was really interesting. As usual, the language sessions, as I think, are most interesting ones. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music, as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details. <laughs>